Yes, I have. Um, so it's, um, I don't think it's exactly virtual, nor is it very new, to be honest, because what we're doing is not virtual. If you think about it, I am real, you are real. We are remote, we are distant, and we have been learning how to use these tools for working mostly, but also for socializing for other reasons for quite a while. They've become a big part of our life, but normally we use them to expand our reach. So these are precious tools that allow us to see and work with people that we couldn't otherwise see or be with in our personal and in our professional life. Now, in this particular moment, it's another story because this virtual remote video conference are the only way we have to see most people in our personal and professional lives. And then I think they can become a lot more stressful. Our experience can flip from one of joy and expansion to actually one of um, restriction and distress. <laughs> I mean, it's changing our lives. I mean, COVID's changed our lives, but uh, um, the amount of time we're spending looking at a screen and speaking to people on screens is changing our lives. How is it affecting our lives? Well, I mean, first there are the usual risks of spending a lot of time sitting down and in front of the screen. If you sit all day in front of a, especially if it's a small screen, a small laptop, there's all kinds of negative effects on your physical health. You might feel stiff, you might put on weight. In the long run, you might become more irritable, have difficulty falling to sleep and all that. But then there are three aspects, as you said, it's not the screens that are changing our lives, it's COVID that's changing our life. And there are three aspects of virtual life in this moment that I want to emphasize. The first one is there are very few transitions. Very often we move from one meeting to another, there's no commute. Uh, you have a work meeting, then you have a conversation with your friends, and then you have drinks with your family, all on the same screens with very little time. And that lack of transition is often very demanding mentally. The second thing is that there's a kind of dissonance. I mean, on the one end, our eyes see the other person, we see each other. I don't think it's actually psychologically accurate to say we see each other, we watch each other. But our bodies still register the absence. And yes. the dissonance is always uncomfortable. And the third one, frankly, is the grief. Maybe it's grief with a small g, but each time we see someone on screen, we are reminded of someone we have lost for a while, of yes. a colleague we cannot see at the office, of a friend we cannot meet with at a bar. And if you put them together, the lack of transition, the dissonance, and the grief, they are three things that put a lot of strain on our bodies and put a lot of strain on our minds. Yes. Um, talking about health, you said we're going to sit down more and look our, at our screens more. We might put on weight. How is it affecting us mentally? Because I also read some of your literature about a mental drain that we feel after looking at yeah. the screens for a long while. I mean, I think if you, I, I don't make too much of a distinction between the physical experience and the mental experience. I think two sides of the same coin. The fatigue is psychological, but it feels physical. And um, it's almost a slight sense of dehumanization, so, of you know, life being sort of real and not real at the same time. That's why it's extremely important if you're doing this, that you take breaks, that you limit your time. If you can't go outside, even on the balcony, um, you know, that you put on some music, that you exercise, you meditate, whatever allows you to reconnect with your body and also to free up your mind from the intensity of, um, of this experience that is both so close and so distant at the same time. Yes, it's real and unreal in a certain way. Um, I'd like to address school kids. We've got yeah. online learning now. They're speaking to their friends. Even kids as young as four and five yeah. are seeing their friends are on a screen now. How is that going to affect them in the long term? I see it every day. I have two, uh, I have two children of school age. We're home together. They are um, incredible. They surprise me every day because, you know, kids are very resilient. And these tools, mine are at uh, 10 and 9, and they, they sort of jump into it. These tools are very much part of their, um, of their lives, and they get on with the opportunity. But at the same time, they miss being in class. Mm -hmm. They miss being in their friends. Because, you see, we have to understand school is not just the lectures, the exercises, the exams, the grades. It's a world. Yes. And the internet for, for children, like for the grown-ups, it's part of that world. How, but it's not the world world. It's how not are they, the whole world. Yes. Is it going to be difficult for them to adjust to the real world post-COVID? I doubt it. 
I doubt it. I think, you know, humans are incredibly resilient, bounce back. The other thing that's important for kids is one thing that comes up is there's an issue of inequality. One of the things that we are discovering is that the digital divide is not just across generation, but it's also within generation. So I think kids who have had support, who have been able to use these tools, who have been able to stay in touch with these tools, who will feel exactly what adults feel, an enormous joy and relief to be on the school bus, to be with their friends, and they'll keep sending them each other WhatsApp messages and silly videos, but they love having a good game of tag and ping pong, and they'll just get on with their lives. For the people who have actually not had access to these digital tools, or maybe for the kids who have fallen behind in schools, who have suffered a lot of stress at home, whose parents have lost their jobs, this will be a real trauma. Yes, and absolutely. again, it's up to us as adults to help them readjust, and I'm sure their friends will help them along the way. Yes. Do you believe that virtual socializing will be something that we will carry on doing post-COVID? Is it here to stay, do you think? <laughs> no. To this extent, no. I think some, yes, but to this extent, no. I think we will want to go back to bars, to restaurants, to the beach, to the mountain hut, to the library, to the office even. We will, for a little bit, we will even enjoy those meetings that should have been an email. Uh, you know, we are social animals. We need each other, we want each other, and we want a degree of touch. Um, I think, of course, we will continue to socialize like this with people that we cannot see. Mm -hmm. um, we, were, we were going through a trend where everyone loved to work at home. I think this is going to probably reverse now also. What do you think? I think we will continue to love to work at home is it, if it's out of choice. Yes. If yes. it's not out of necessity. Yes. So, I, can't th I think it's the constraint that is difficult, mm -hmm. not uh, the predicament. Yes. Social distancing has brought about less physical contact, yet mm. virtual meetings allows people into our homes, which sometimes we're allowing people into a private place. Certain, usually we only have friends, close friends or family at home. Now everyone's seeing our homes, our houses. Um, how are we going to adjust to that? And is that doing something to us today? Some, something detrimental is, is it is it sort of you know you're allowing people into your private space absolutely um, I think it depends on what home means to you home is one of those things like families that can have um, an enormous amount of meeting some of so it can mean something comfortable and joyful but it can also be something difficult and uh, and on occasion full of pain so uh, it can be an intrusion, it can be a relief to having people in. I mean, it has to be said, the disappearing of personal and professional boundary, it's not started uh, two or three months ago. It's been going on for a while. Lots of people have been working, more and more people haven't worked in organization, haven't worked in offices, have, have had to work from home. And in many cases, we've even celebrated the disappearing of these boundaries. I mean, if you think about how much we've talked about authenticity at work and how important it is that I can be myself at work. Now, what we're realizing is there might be a little bit too much of a good thing huh? yes. because authenticity humanizes us, but as you say, it also makes us vulnerable. And again, I would say the issue now is that we are not really inviting people in our private space. Very often we have to have them because otherwise we wouldn't see them at all. So it can feel a little bit like an intrusion. Yes. When it's a real invitation, I think it's absolutely fine. In many ways, it expands our relationship. But when it feels an intrusion, it of course is an additional source of stress on top of the stress we all are already experiencing because of the crisis. Yes. Um, I wanted to address something which we haven't spoken about before, about retail therapy, going to the shops. I think <laughs> we're probably going to be quite hungry for that. How is that going to affect online trading post-COVID? Um, <laughs> you're asking me to make predictions about in a year's time where I don't even only, know. Only an hard. opinion, not we a prediction, an opinion. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do think we will continue to use these tools, and I think for a long time, yes, we will be hungry uh, for retail, for experiences, but we will also be very cautious about be going outside and uh, mixing with people. So I imagine we will still want to go to shops and to malls, but 
I don't think uh, if you are, if you were asking me if I think the big online retail giants will suffer, I wouldn't bet on that. Yes, the world has obviously become a much uh, a more accessible place to everyone with uh, this virtual connection. Um, that's positive, though, isn't it? Uh, I think the more connection, the better. The yes. more connections, the better. Um, the question is whether they are connection or whether it's just proximity. Because I know we know that when we have differences and we connect, then often that's something generally good for society as a whole. When we are different and we are in proximity and that proximity sparks more misunderstanding, that's what's happening in, on the internet for the last 10, 20 years, then I think it's a little bit more problematic because you see uh, polarization. So as long as we keep making an effort to make these remote connections, real connections, I think it's a positive trend. But again, that's why we feel so fatigued and so exhausted because we are not used to it. That's not the way we normally, uh, our colleagues and friends, um, we'll get used to it. But I, my guess is we'll still want to have the, um, the real proximal experience. Professor Petillieri, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts, your opinions with us. And I look forward to touching base with you again very soon. Good evening. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was uh, Professor Petrilieri um, from INSEAD Business School. He's a doctor, medical doctor.